We're live. We are live. Calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London. Calling Rick Beyer in... Mexico. Mexico. Hola, Chris. Oh, hola, Rick. Hola. This is, but this isn't the first time History Happy Hour has come to Mexico, because you remember Andrew Roberts was here when we interviewed I know. him. And I Why don't know I if, to go to Mexico? I don't know if the view from his condo was quite as nice as the view from mine, but... That's a postcard. That's not good. That is a photo I took oh, 10 minutes ago, so there you go. Please. I know. I won't rubbing it in. Try to concentrate. Well, Welcome, everyone, to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help uh, and support of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. And Chris and I may be traveling to sunny beaches or historic battlefields or wherever, but we're still here on Sundays to have a cocktail and talk about history with you. And today we'll be talking about Robert E. Lee. It's a, it's a show I'm really looking forward to. And I want to give a big thank you, Chris, to our Patreon supporters. And here's our Top Shelf supporters. And we... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No. Go I thought you had a, something to say. I was just going to say thank you. Yes. Okay. And uh, we, we, we want to just say, uh, if you want to join the people who are supporting us on Patreon, go to patreon.com slash history happy hour. Uh, and Chris, who have we got watching today? Oh, well, we've got uh, Stephen Dean and Xavier from Spain. So we have our international contingent. Uh, Nancy from Houston. Uh, Chuck Ludlam and uh, Gene Templin. So the Templins are... Viewing us from always cold Pennsylvania, but we so are glad they're here. Oh, we got Jim in Menlo Park and Ann in Little Rock and lots of other people too. So mm-hmm. we want to welcome everybody and especially any first time viewers. If you're watching us on Facebook, please follow us. If you're watching us on the History Happy Hour YouTube page, please subscribe to get news of future broadcasts. I think I got all that out of the way, okay. Chris. There we go. Hold on. It, you think we've killed enough time to I get this thing so. started? Well, I give believe. me give me a cue that I can. Wa- hold on, hold on. Not quite well, ready I, yet. I, 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 I've uh, okay, okay. Cue. And the, the bar, bar. Oh, the is open, and the bell yeah. made it to Mexico. Yes. The floor is yours. Yes. Well, I mean, uh, super excited uh, about this week's show. Uh, we're going to be joined by Professor Alan Gelzo. Uh, and Professor Gelzo serves as the Senior Research Scholar in the Council of Humanities and the Director of the Initiative on Politics and Statesmanship at the James Madison Program at Princeton. He was prof- uh, formerly a Professor of History at Gettysburg College. And he has written more books that if I listed them all, we would not have any time to talk about uh, his new biography. But amongst his publications are Abraham Lincoln, Redeemer President, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, The End of Slavery in America, Gettysburg, The Last Invasion, and Reconstruction, A Concise History. But tonight we're here to talk about his new biography of Robert E. Lee, A Life. So, there we go. Yeah, so... Alan, welcome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It is it is good to be in the midst of a happy hour. There he is. It always is. Yes, it's always a good <laughs> sign. Chris, I have a Mexican stout, believe it or not. Yeah. Is there such a thing? It turns out. Oh, so there you I, go. I'm just That's water a, tonight. But, uh, oh, bummer. So but, start us off. Yeah, well, uh, first goes on. Um, when looking through your list of publications, you are clearly... Um, a, a great and accomplished scholar of Lincoln, and that would be something that I would assume that if you were to write a book, it would be something about Lincoln or the Union or the Union war effort. I would not have expected you to decide to do a new biography of Robert E. Lee, so I'm kind of curious as to why you chose Lee as a topic and, and what got you uh, interested in, in doing it. Well, partly. There's a contrarian streak in me. <laughs> <laughs> so that having done as much work as I've done on Abraham Lincoln and on the Union aspect of the Civil War. Um, There always was the little voice that would say, yeah, but you you should zig when they zag and perhaps look at things through the other end of the telescope. And that was in large measure what led me to think about writing about Robert E. Lee. Uh, If I was to look at the possibilities for writing a book after the work that I have done on on Lincoln, on Gettysburg, on Reconstruction, I I could, for instance, turn to Ulysses Grant. The problem is that 
over the last 35 years, there have been eight freestanding biographies of Grant, the most recent of which, Ron Chernow's. Uh, if I had turned, for instance, to William Tecumseh Sherman, well, you have, over the last 25 years, something like 10 or 11 biographies of William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, after that, you start to look for someone who would really be worth the effort of sinking your teeth into, and you start really to come up short. And at that point, the eye turns to someone like Robert E. Lee. Because if you look to the Confederate side of things, uh, the leadership of the Confederacy was, well, it was a, a, a fairly unimpressive roster, starting with Jefferson Davis as president, moving down through Alex Stevens as vice president, and so on and so forth. The one great standout for the Confederacy is Robert E. Lee. If there is a person on the Confederate side that you want to use as a balance to talking about, let's say, Abraham Lincoln, then the yin to that yang is clearly Robert E. Lee. So those inclinations pointed me in the direction of Lee. And perhaps there was also one other thing, and that was the matter of challenge. How do you write the biography of someone who committed treason? Uh, that was a challenge in its own right, because it presents you with a very difficult subject to write about. When you write about Abraham Lincoln, you can you can admire Abraham Lincoln. You can admire Ulysses Grant. You can admire William Tecumseh Sherman. Robert E. Lee, it's much more difficult to do because at the end of the day, you cannot escape this one very simple fact. And that is, he raised his hand against the oath he, he had taken, against the flag he had served, and against the country that he had pledged himself to. Uh, how do you reconcile? How do you write difficult biography. And the fact is you can't avoid writing difficult biography because not every biographical subject is going to be an easier appealing one. How do you write difficult biography and especially how do you write the biography of someone who committed treason? And I don't use the term lightly either. No, and, and you, I go ahead, Chris. Oh, so I just want a quick follow up. And do you think that it's that complexity that might be why there haven't been as many recent biographies of, of Lee? I mean, you talk about, you know, the biographies of Sherman and Grant, and do you think maybe that's why that, that topic hasn't been touched until you revisited it? Well, I think that is part of it. There's also, there's also a more practical logistical question, and that is um, Lee's papers, and, and Lee was a compulsive letter writer. When it, when it came to private correspondence, he must have written easily somewhere between six and 8,000 letters in his lifetime, sometimes multiple letters on a single day. The difficulty is that there's no central collection of them. Right. There's no one place you can go or maybe two places you can go and just kind of set up shop and work through the material. Instead, there are some fairly large collections at places like Washington and Lee University, the Library of Congress, uh, the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. But beyond that, there, Lee's papers are scattered in penny packets all the way from the Morgan Library in New York City to the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. And, and it points all between. And tracking all of that down is, let's say, a challenge just in its own right. Contrast that with Lincoln. You have the Basler edition of the complete works of Abraham Lincoln. You can go to that very easily. You have the uh, edition of the papers of Ulysses S. Grant. You can go to that very easily. You have collections of papers of William Tecumseh Sherman. Much easier to access that way. Lee, it is formidable. Hmm. The simple logistical problem yeah. of accessing, pulling together all of the material that would have Robert E. Lee's name on it. Uh, that, uh, that is a challenge in its own right, and I think it has scared away a number of potential biographers of Lee. And then maybe another thing which scares them away, too, is the fact that in the 1930s, one person did, in fact, scale that Himalayan range of challenge, and that was Douglas Southall Freeman, uh, who produced a four-volume biography of Robert E. Lee, which won the Pulitzer Prize. And it was extremely well researched. Uh, the material that you find marching along the bottom of the pages and the footnotes is daunting just to look at because you're always thinking, my goodness, how did he find all this material? Um, people look at that, those four volumes and they say, how can we improve on that? Yeah. And that is another discouragement. Uh, 
uh, for people who are inclined to take uh, at least some thought of writing about Robert E. Lee. Mm. Well, of course, um, I think it's fair to say that Freeman is... um uh, his admiration of Lee is not tempered uh, by much concern oh, no. over over trees. And you've written a much more sort of even-handed biography, which I think resonates with the temper of the times. You talked about this moment, which is the pivotal moment in Lee's life, uh, and you devote uh, where he throws in with the South, this moment in the spring of 1861. And you devote a lot of time to it in the book, which was great because you really dived down into the details. Here's a guy who spent 30 years in the U.S. Army. Let me put up a picture a little younger than we usually see. I think this is him from uh, early 1850s, right? Mid-1850s? Probably um, mid-1850s. Yeah. He, yeah, it's based on, uh, based on some images that were done when he was the superintendent at West Point. Right. So here he is. He spent 30 years in the U.S. Army, swore an oath to protect the government, said he didn't like slavery, hated secession, secession is revolution, secession is treason, uh, he is up to that point in his life, the soul of caution in almost everything he does. And then with surprising ease, at least as I look at it, he says, oh, OK, I'll take up arms against the United States. No problem. And in fact, I will be one of the leaders of the army. And he almost he almost seems to fall into this. And I know he's not alone. Right. There's a number of people who are faced with this choice. I always find it perplexing and I never found convincing the idea of well, he was loyal to his state. He was loyal to Virginia. Um, listen, what, what? I know it's a complex subject, but what's your take on this? Well, <laughs> complex it definitely, definitely is. Uh, when Freeman tried to talk about Lee's decision, he, he simplified it in terms of saying, well, this was the decision Lee was made to make. This was the decision that his character dictated that he should make and i found that and the first time i encountered it to be wholly inadequate given the nature of the decision itself Um, a decision to commit treason is not something you just simply one day wake up and say hey it's what i was made to do (laughs) no i'm sorry that doesn't happen that way not not when as rick as you've said he has already set up so many trial balloons that suggest exactly the opposite. And then when you look at his career as a Confederate general, my goodness, nobody, nobody seemed to complain more about the failures of the Confederate leadership and the shortcomings of the Confederate people more than Robert E. Lee. He was their most unsparing critic. So what accounts for the decision that he makes? I don't think it can be simply written off the way it is sometimes done by saying, well, Lee felt he was obliged to follow his native state, Virginia. When Virginia secedes from the Union, Lee believes he's obligated to go with it. That's an explanation that Lee himself offers, but only after the war, when he is brought before the Joint Committee on Reconstruction, when he is under indictment for treason. He doesn't really lay that kind of argument out at any time before, and certainly not during the process of decision. And I think there's good reason for that. For one thing, he doesn't really live in Virginia for most of his life. When uh, Robert E. Lee is born in, uh, in 1807, he's born on the northern neck of Virginia, but he's only there for some four, five, six years. His family then uproots and moves to Alexandria. And people think, oh, well, that's Virginia. No, not when he moved there. In the uh, early part of the 19th century, when Robert E. Lee is growing up in Alexandria, Alexandria is part of the District of Columbia. Alexandria is not retroceded to Virginia until long after Robert Lee has left Alexandria, gone to West Point, become a cadet, and gone into the United States military. So when he grows up, he grows up as a young man in the District of Columbia. And then, of course, for his education, he goes to West Point. After that, he has appointments to various positions in Georgia, in St. Louis, in Baltimore, in New York. Uh, He does spend some time in Virginia. He marries a Virginian, and he'll spend holidays at at his in-law's estate, Arlington, uh, across the river from the capital. But he actually spends more time 
concentrated time in his life in New York <laughs> than he does in Virginia because he had two, actually, if you count his uh, college uh, years, uh, he, he's got three postings that take him to New York. He is a cadet at West Point. He is the post engineer at Fort Hamilton on the Narrows. Uh, and then he's the superintendent at West Point uh, in the mid 1850s. He actually spends more time in New York that way. From there, he goes to Texas to become Lieutenant Colonel of the Second Cavalry. By the time we get to 1860, uh, he's actually spent more time, more concentrated time in other places than he has ever actually spent in Virginia. So is this some romantic Virginian loyalty? Uh, is he is he singing Carry Me Back to Old Virginia? I don't really <laughs> so. I think there are a number of other factors which are operative in the making of Lee's decision, and not the least of which is the complex status of um, the title that the Lee family may have to Arlington. So there you go. I'm, I, I almost, you almost, I almost left, my, I almost left yeah, myself yeah. muted there. Uh, well, can I do a follow-up, Chris? Yep, yeah, so very briefly. I mean, I thought your, 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 your argument in, in brief that, that was that he is, he's concerned literally about his, his property, as you say, and, the, and, the, and his family, what gets left to his family, so that he's not so much being loyal to an ideal of Virginia as he is perhaps making a narrow decision based on what's going to be good for the Lees, which, of course, turns out to be a catastrophically wrong decision uh, as well. Yeah. Uh, I thought originally that what I was looking at was a decision which Lee makes. And in fact, I, one early version of this I wrote as an article for the Civil War Monitor. I called it simply the decision, uh, trying to describe this process in April of 1861. But the more I worked on it, the more I realized this was really a series of decisions. This was really a fall of dominoes for Robert E. Lee. And the fall of dominoes begins really with Arlington. Robert Lee married Mary Anna Randolph Custis. She was the daughter and only child of George Washington Park Custis, the step-grandson of George Washington. George Washington Park Custis owned the property that sat on the bluffs looking overlooking the Potomac and really overlooking the District of Columbia, where he built this apparently palatial home that he called Arlington. Today, we think of it as Arlington National Cemetery. But before the Civil War, it, it was Arlington, the property of the Custis family. Lee marries into the Custis family. And when George Washington Park Custis dies in 1857, you might have expected that Robert E. Lee would, well, along with his wife, inherit the property. No. One of the big shocks that you discover in the life of Robert E. Lee is that when George Washington Park Custis dies in 1857, he cuts Robert E. Lee out of the will completely. Hmm. Uh, the only thing Robert Lee gets from his father-in-law are two town lots in the District of Columbia. Uh, this, is, this is a really odd moment. But I think it testifies to the fact that many elite Virginians, of which the Custises were certainly one, really looked askance at the Lees. The Lees had an unhappy reputation, starting with Robert Lee's father, Light Horse Harry Lee, for being, let us say, unpredictable morally. And a lot of Robert E. Lee's life is, is actually dedicated to trying to erase the stain that is left on the Lee name by his father and by his half, his older half brother, uh, Henry the Fourth uh, Lee, and that sense that the Lees are not entirely morally reliable, I think, has a lot to do with why George Washington Park Custis does not include Robert in the will. Instead, the property in Arlington goes to Robert E. Lee's oldest son, George Washington Custis Lee. It jumps the generations. This is so appalling that Custis Lee actually writes to his father and says, I'd be happy to sign over Arlington to you. You know, this is, this is totally wrong, what my grandfather did. But Robert Lee's response is, no, this is what your grandfather wanted. We're going to go through with it. 
But it does mean then that the Lee hold on Arlington suddenly been rendered tenuous. It's going to have to jump a generation. All right, take it forward now to April of 1861. Look at the decision that Lee is going to have to make. If he accepts the offer which is made to him by Abraham Lincoln through Francis Preston Blair of command of the Union forces that are going to suppress the Confederate rebellion, one of two things can happen. He can be unsuccessful, or at least Virginia can secede from the Union and seize Arlington. If he's going to command Union armies, why shouldn't Arlington seize his property in retribution? Because look, it's sitting on a very strategic piece of property too. So he could lose Arlington and everything for his family at one stroke just by accepting that command. On the other hand, suppose he heeds the song that is being sung to him by Virginia authorities, which is, come to Richmond and talk to us about military preparations. If he goes to Richmond, well, he has heard over and over again from General Scott that there isn't going to be a war if there's not going to be a war, then the federal government's not going to cross the Potomac and seize Arlington. So if he goes and, and plays ball with the Virginia authorities, then, then Arlington will be safe. And then, perhaps on top of that, he can play a role as a mediator in this secession crisis. I mean, one thing we don't always appreciate is that in April of 1861, nobody knew there was actually going to be a war. In April of 1861, there was still tremendous amounts of hesitation on both sides about exactly who was going to do what and what the result was going to be. And there were many people who thought, well, we've had this terrible blow up over this business of Fort Sumter and the secession of the seven Gulf and South Atlantic states. But look, calmer heads are going to prevail. And once the calmer heads get in charge of things, we're going to have a a national convention that's going to reconstruct the union and everything's going to be okay. Well, who would be in a better position to have that kind of calming influence than Robert E. Lee in Richmond? And into the bargain, he saves Arlington. This is why when he finally goes to speak to General Scott to explain why he has turned down the offer that was made to him by Francis Preston Blair, first thing that he cites is, his family and his family's property and how he needs to protect that. And I think that is the real key to his decision. He doesn't make this decision as some kind of flag-waving, enthusiastic Southern rebel. When he goes to Richmond, it's always with the, the voice of caution. It's how we must not provoke the, the, the federal government. When he takes charge of Virginia forces, one of the first orders he gives is to an unpredictable former VMI instructor named Thomas Jonathan Jackson, who is in command at Fort at at, uh, at Harper's Ferry. Uh, Jackson uh, crosses the Potomac, establishes uh, an outpost on the Maryland side of the river, and Lee tells him to come back. Don't go. Don't cross the Potomac. Don't provoke any fighting. Don't provoke any shooting. The idea here was that he was actually going to be some kind of peace broker once all the crazy people had had their chance to say their say. Well, it doesn't turn out that way. It doesn't. Instead, things do funnel down into a civil war. And in some respects, I think nobody was more disappointed at that prospect than Robert E. Lee himself. But having made the decisions... He couldn't unmake them. So, uh, Dr. Gelza, one of the things that I've always had trouble with with Lee is getting a sense of kind of what's going on behind the mask. You know, he um, will hopefully touch on it later, but there's a book called The Marble Man, and that's got like a whole separate set of issues. But just the, just that title, you know, you see him in the picture, but you don't really know what he's thinking. Um, and, uh, you know, Douglas Southall Freeman, the earlier biographer, you uh, point this out. He says, there's no mystery at all to Robert E. Lee. Right. Well, clearly, as you so ably show in the book, that's not the case. And you talk about um, Lee had three poles that kind of governed him. So just, you know, I think it would help our listeners uh, or viewers to know what are the three poles and kind of how do they manifest themselves in, in him? I think the three 
holes, so to speak. I'm almost thinking of it in terms of as, as, as a kind of electrical charge. But certainly one of those poles is Lee's pursuit of perfection. He was a perfectionist. Not just because he wanted to cross every T and dot every I. Uh, he was a perfectionist in what he expected of himself and what he expected from others in terms of their behavior. And you do have to wonder what drives someone that hard and pushes them in that way. I think a lot has to do with something I referred to earlier, and that is the reputation of the Lees. Think of it in these terms. Lee's father was Light Horse Harry Lee, a great hero of the revolution, commander of one of Washington's cavalry units, uh, and an innovative, improvisatory, and sometimes half-cocked uh, cavalry uh, star of the revolution. When the revolution is over, so for all practical purposes is Light Horse Harry Lee's career. He's got no more battles to fight. He tries to get involved in real estate investment. He marries into uh, another branch of the Lee family. That's what brings him the estate, Stratford Hall, on the northern neck of Virginia. But every decision the man makes financially is a catastrophe. He wants to put money into uh, real, real estate speculation and the development of canals, the development of uh, new residential and business areas, all up and down the Potomac, all up into the Blue Ridge, and not a single one of them works out. If, if this man was alive today, he'd be investing in ski resorts in Bangladesh. <laughs> so, uh, Light Horse Harry, I mean, it's... It, he burns through the cash of his first wife. He marries a Virginia Carter. He burns through her cash. And finally, it's so bad, he, he winds up in prison for debt. And it's at that point that his, uh, his second wife, uh, Ann Carter Lee, finally says, I, you know, I, I can't live like this. We're, we're going to have to move. And that's when they make the move to Alexandria. There, Lee just keeps on making one more mistake after another, this time political mistakes. He's a federalist. He's a federalist in Thomas Jefferson's Virginia. All right, bad political move. Right. And ends up being beaten within an inch of his life by a Jeffersonian mob in Baltimore. At that point, he leaves. He leaves for the West Indies, ostensibly because he's trying to recover his health. Uh, but in fact, he's trying to stay one leap ahead of the bill collectors. So off he goes to the West Indies. That is the last that Robert Lee sees of his father. He's six years old. There is no hurt in the catalog of human hurts that has a worse impact than the loss of a parent before the onset of adolescence. And that marks Robert E. Lee. And it marks him as someone who is going by his own perfect conduct to make right all the mistakes his father made. And he will spend his life that. And the, the giveaway for me about this was a, was a very odd fact. It was, a, it was one of those dog that didn't bark realizations. And that was in all of Robert Lee's correspondence, from the very first surviving letter we have in 1824, uh, all the way up until December of 1861, he never mentions his father, never talks mm, about wow. his father. The only fact, the only, there, is only, there is one mention in that very first letter, it's his application letter to West Point, where he's trying to basically cash in on the fact that his father's a revolutionary veteran. Apart from that, even when he is, gets his first posting to what is today Fort Pulaski, uh, outside of Savannah, uh, he's only actually a few miles away from where his father is buried. Because his father did make it back to the United States, but his father was mortally ill at the time, landed on the Carolina coast, to the Georgia coast, uh, and dies two weeks afterwards. Even when Lee is there, Posting, getting, being posted there on a West Point. He doesn't visit the grave. I thought, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. And that absence I found 
very, very peculiar. If only because every time Robert Lee gets introduced to people, otherwise, it's always in terms of meet Robert E. Lee, the son of Light Horse Harry Lee. That's what everyone is going to know him for before the Civil War. That he's the son of Light Horse Harry. But he will never talk about it, not even to his siblings. And I, again, this is the dog that doesn't bark. And this is, a, this is someone who is the soul of caution and the pursuit of perfection, doing everything right that his father did not do. So that's the first thing. Second thing is independence. What he really wants is to be able to stand on his own two feet, not to be the shadow of his father, not to be anything except who he is and what he is. He wants independence. It's one reason why he stays in the army. Robert E. Lee, strictly speaking, didn't need a career in the army. He inherited some money from his mother, which he always claimed was just minimal. Well, when you look at the actual amounts and the property that was involved, actually he 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 did very well by his mother's estate. He could have he could have lived independently, and especially when he marries Marianna Randolph Custis, he could have lived at Arlington without ever having to, to lift a finger again. He doesn't. He doesn't. What he wants is independence. He wants to be his own man. Now, the problem is that living independently is not always a very secure proposition. That, that means he definitely is going to stay in the army because of the one thing the army guarantees, it's a paycheck world without end. There's, there's no, I mean, in the, in the pre-Civil pre War army, there's no retirement system. You stay in on full pay at full rank until you assume room temperature. And <laughs> that, I mean, it was, it was an ideal, so it, the pay was not great. Uh, you, you could get sent to uh, odd places all around the North American continent. But one thing you had was definitely security. So those three things, I think, that really, really pushed the man. Perfection, independence, security. And those three are not always, they're not always coordinated with each other. Because he has security being married into the Custis family. But that doesn't mean he gets independence from the Custises. Oh, no, 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 no. The Custises want him in the worst way to come to Arlington and basically be the major domo right. for their estate. And he doesn't want to be under their finger. And yet, he also wants security. How is he going to get it? He's going to get it through the army. He is, he's hitting these poles at different moments in his life, always in that pursuit of things. Curiously, he doesn't really get them all lined up again until the Civil War. The Civil War is the moment when Robert Lee finally comes into his own as Robert E. Lee, as an independent personality on his own. And it's significant that that is also the moment when he finally starts talking about his father. Now, it becomes even more apparent after the war when he becomes the president of Washington College. Because when he becomes president of Washington College, he gets security because he's the man who is going uh, without question. He's going to be the man who's going to make Washington College a success. Otherwise, the place is kaput after the Civil War. But he also gets independence with it because when the Board of Trustees appoints him as president of Washington College, they may have thought they were appointing a figurehead somebody whose name would look good on the letterhead of the uh, correspondence mm -mm -mm. when robert e lee takes charge as president of washington college he takes charge of them they become the figureheads mm -hmm. and he starts revolutionizing the curriculum I and mean, it's an extraordinary thing, thing to see happen but he turns washington college upside down in terms of its faculty its curriculum and well, surprisingly enough, there's no, there's no inkling of this anywhere in his life before this. He is a great fundraiser. I mean, this man knew how to shake the apples out of the trees. He takes a college in 1865 that, that barely has any money in the bank. And within five years, he's built up a quarter of a million dollar endowment. A quarter of a million dollar endowment, that's a lot of moolah in 1865 to 1870. 
Uh, and, he, and the amazing thing, he does it mostly from Northerners. Hmm. He's able to persuade Northerners to send lots and lots of money to the support of Washington College. But he also gets perfection there, too. <coughs> there's, Alan, this, okay. there's a wonderful story about Lee. You know, when, when students would come to Washington College, he would interview each one, and he would tell them this. He would say, we have no rule book here at Washington College. You know, we just, all we require is that everyone shall be a gentleman. And people look at that and they say, oh, isn't that generous of him? No, it's not. What it means is Robert E. Lee is the rule book. Robert E. Lee is the judge. And his judgment is going to be perfection. He finally gets all three of those lined up. Alan, I want to. Uh, we have a, a bunch of questions that people have uh, put up on our on our question board here, and I'm going to try to synthesize a few of them in, into one question. And I do want to also just answer one person to say, the background noise is because I'm on a balcony in Mexico uh, today for today's show. We did get a question about that. Um, hola. Anyway, so um, uh, people want to know about Lee's generalship, and obviously this could fill let's say half a book because it does uh, 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 in your book so you're gonna have to we're gonna have to to be short on that but one person Chuck Ludlam says is it fair to say that Lee didn't need to invade the North either time and when he did he made huge mistakes Um, and another person uh, asks um, you know was Lee that good or was he just lucky to face incompetent generals from the Union and I would throw in I I don't want to Throw so many questions at you that you're, you know, that you're going to be answering until Tuesday. But what I want to know, we've talked about this man craves security. He's cautious, and then he becomes the commander of the Confederate forces, and he seems to transform into a riverboat gambler, who is one of the whose audacity itself, according to one of the. Uh, uh, the people in his in his circle who wrote about it. So uh, give us a little bit on Lee as a as a general and, and whether we should respect that or whether we he's just gotten a good reputation uh, by being in the right place at the right time. That comment about Lee's audacity uh, comes through Edward Porter Alexander, who uh, later rose to become chief of uh, Lee's artillery, and it. It it derives from a conversation Alexander had with a staff member uh, of Jefferson Davis's, a member of Jefferson Davis's staff, um, Joseph Ives. And Alexander, who in 1862 didn't know very much about Lee, was wondering out loud, is is Lee, I mean, Lee's an engineer. Uh, Is he really going to be able to lead people or is he just going to dig trenches? And Ives's response was categoric. It was, oh, Robert E. Lee is the soul of audacity. You're going to be surprised. He is audacity personified. Uh, To a certain extent, that's true. Now, I say to a certain extent, because it's not because Lee was impulsive. Let's not mistake audacity for impulsiveness. Uh, Impulsiveness is usually a quality in a general that gets punished pretty severely. But Lee was audacious in this sense. Lee had a very clear grasp of what the strategic necessities were in the Civil War. Lee understood what the power of the North was. He he spent so much time there. He knew. He also knew, or at least believed he knew, the weaknesses of the South. That too many people in the South simply expected that secession was going to be peaceful and uncontested and that they weren't going to have to make any sacrifices. Well, Lee realized almost as soon as he is put into serious command in 1862 by Jefferson Davis, that the Confederacy is not going to be able to fight a 15-round heavyweight bout with the North. It's, it's not going to be able to do that. It's not going to last that long. It doesn't, have, it doesn't have the strength. What the Confederacy has to do, if it's going to win, is to come out swinging in the early rounds, score an early surprise knockout, and declare a victory. And the way to do that is not to sit around in Virginia waiting for the Union Army to come and steamroll you. The way to win that kind of war is to move aggressively north of the Potomac into Maryland, rally Maryland to the Confederate cause, move into Pennsylvania, either win a military victory 
in Pennsylvania that will completely embarrass the Lincoln administration or just occupy time moving around in Pennsylvania and showing how weak, ineffective, and inadequate the Lincoln administration is for the conduct of a war and thus let political consequences take the heart out of the Union war effort. And Lee saw that very carefully. That was the only way the Confederacy was going to win. And that's the tactic that he is, that's the strategy that he is going to employ in 1862 and which probably would have taken him into Pennsylvania on exactly that logic had it not been for the infamous lost orders, special order number 191, which was lost and then discovered by Union soldiers and put into the hands of General George McClellan. And that brings on the Battle of Antietam. And that pretty much aborts the proposed invasion Lee was conducting in 1862. But Lee's back at it in 1863, and that's what takes him to Gettysburg. And if it hadn't been for the fact that Ulysses Grant launches his overland campaign as early as he does in May of 1864, Lee was contemplating yet another incursion north of the Potomac, all with a view to appealing to northern war weariness and forcing a political end to the war and the opening of negotiations. That much Lee saw very clearly, perhaps even more clearly than any other important Confederate leader. So as a strategist, my ranking of him is four stars. He understood the, law, the he understood the big picture and what had to be done in terms of that big picture for the Confederacy to win. As a tactician, a battlefield tactician, it's less easy to estimate Lee because his own his own expressed philosophy was to, as he explained to the Prussian military observer, Eustace Schiebert, uh, his philosophy was, it was his job to bring the various elements of his army to the battlefield. But once there, it was the job of his subordinates to do the actual fighting and to win the battle. So in that respect, he wanted to take a, a hands-off tactical uh, position. And as long as he had good subordinates who could carry that out, that was that was a workable proposition. And he had good subordinates in James Longstreet and Stonewall Jackson. But Jackson, of course, he loses at Chancellorsville in 1863. And Longstreet's taken off the board at the Wilderness in May of 1864. Uh, I mean, Longstreet will make something of a recovery and return to service uh, by the end of the war, but for much of the Overland campaign, Longstreet's out of action. At that moment, Lee has to start taking tactical charge himself because he just doesn't have terribly good material to work with anywhere below that level. And it's very clear he does not find taking tactical control to be a very pleasant proposition. Uh, sometimes it'll in fact mean that he tries to ride out into the front of the battle and take charge of actual unit action himself. That is a that's a council of desperation. When a, when a major field commander feels that that's the only solution he has, that's telling you that he really doesn't know what to do next. That's not a good sign. If he was a great strategic thinker, but more of a mystery as a tactician, probably the grade I would give him as an operational commander in charge of supply, logistics, and movement, that's probably where the grade is poorest. And it's poorest because that's the moment when we're talking about operations and logistics, when a commander has to interface with the politicians. And one thing Lee was utterly averse to doing was confronting the politicians. So it means that Lee's army goes chronically unsupplied during the war. And Lee really does not confront the politicians about it. He does not go to Jefferson Davis and say, look, your commissary general, Lucius Northrop, he's a total incompetent. Get rid of him. He does not go to Davis and say, your quartermaster general is, is a hopeless nincompoop. Get rid of him. I mean, in a sense, Robert E. Lee could have said those things to Jefferson Davis. But he won't do it because he's phobic on this subject of confronting the politicians.
And for that reason, logistically and operationally, Lee is much less of a success than he could have been or should have been. Certainly much less of a success than he was either tactically or strategically. But, but do you think, kind of picking up on that, uh, Dr. Kozla, do you think that he was, it was wrong to, that he was so focused on Virginia? Because, you know, in the book you talk about um, how he's eventually given supreme command for whatever way you want to, however you want to describe that. But that doesn't really change his outlook. It doesn't, he doesn't all of a sudden say, okay, now I'm dealing with two theaters and this is what we're going to do. Um, is that a, the right decision? Is it, is it the wrong? I mean, I'm just kind of curious how he, he just seems so focused on Virginia, if that's a criticism. Well, I, the people have sometimes said, and Thomas Connolly in 1977, when he wrote The Marble Man, uh, made this argument as explicit as it's ever been made. Uh, Connolly, who was the great historian of the Confederate Western theater, hmm. uh, really believed that Robert E. Lee helped to destroy the Confederacy by channeling so much of the Confederacy's resources into Virginia, because he was a Virginian. Uh, when really the, the really important operational theater of the Civil War was the West. So uh, Connolly positions Lee as this person who sucks in the Confederacy's resources, sucks in Confederate attention to his own Virginia, uh, and thus leaves the West uh, to, to look out for itself, which Connolly thought was really what contributed to the, the defeat of the Confederacy. I'm not convinced of that. Right. I'm not convinced of it, largely because, like it or not, Virginia really was the key piece of territory for the Confederacy. Virginia, especially, especially after the early spring of 1862, when for all practical purposes the Confederacy lost any hope of recruiting Kentucky, when the Confederacy lost control of most of Tennessee, most of the Confederacy's infant industries were in the upper south and those were the first things that were lost the only place that you really had serious industrial um, uh, capacity uh, after uh, the midpoint of 1862 was virginia if you lose virginia it's over there's really no way the confederacy can continue to carry on uh, the supply of war so lee understands that virginia really is the, the major piece of territory, it is the vital piece of real estate that the Confederacy must hold on to. And within Virginia, especially Richmond and Petersburg. Right. He, was, he was very clear in 1862 when, uh, when McClellan threatened Richmond, we cannot abandon Richmond. If we abandon Richmond, it's all over. In 1864, when Grant is making his move through the Overland Campaign, uh, Lee is very explicit. He says, see, if Grant m manages to clamp Richmond and Petersburg into a siege, then it's all over. It's, we're not going to be able to survive. And he was right, because when Grant finally does capture uh, Petersburg and Richmond uh, at the beginning of April 1865, Lee's army survives for exactly one week on its own before mm -hmm. it finally surrenders at Appomattox. So Lee's thinking actually was, again, strategically speaking, very clear. The really key theater was uh, Richmond. The war could be lost there by the loss of Richmond, or the war could be won there either by successfully threatening Washington, D.C., or by inflicting so much political pain on the North and northern states, especially Pennsylvania, um, that uh, the northern public finally says, we're sick of this, we're going to require uh, Lincoln to go to the negotiating table. Um, I, when, when Lee dies in 1870, the New York Herald writes, and you have this in your book, we have long since ceased to look upon him as the Confederate leader, but now have claimed him as one of ourselves. This is five years after he led uh, Confederate forces against the United States in a war that killed more American soldiers than any war ever. Um, that's a pretty remarkable transformation. Uh, of course, nowadays, um, uh, that view is perhaps no longer uh, extant quite the same way. Uh, we have Lee statues coming down uh, all over the place, people kind of uh, rising up in arms about some of that. So, so what would Robert E. Lee uh, make 
of Robert E. Lee's statues coming down and sort of the transformation in his own reputation from 1870 to today? I think Robert E. Lee would be surprised and distressed that there were Robert E. Lee statues at all. <laughs> um, in, in the last five years of his life, he, he had repeated appeals made to him to attend reunions, uh, especially with, with union officers. Uh, in 1869, he was invited to a big jamboree that was supposed to be held at Gettysburg that would bring the principal commanders from that battle back together to accomplish, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what, but all right, at least to get them all together and everyone shaking hands and being nice to each other. Lee declines. It's a good photo up. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, it was, it was an op that didn't happen in this case because Lee writes to the organizer, David McConaughey, and says, I really don't think this is something that I want to do uh, because I just think we need to move on from this. We need to stop thinking about the war. Uh, when people suggest, for instance, one of his former cavalry commanders, Thomas Rosser, uh, makes a proposal to him on behalf of a Confederate women's organization uh, to erect a monument to fallen Confederate soldiers. Lee discourages this. He says that's, that's only going to aggravate bad feeling. We've got to move beyond that. He writes a letter to Verena Davis, the wife of the former Confederate president, and says pretty much the same thing. Uh, we have got to put the past behind us, and we've got to move into the future. Part of that, I think, is part of it is a is an idealism that you can applaud to a certain extent. I mean, here is someone who is telling the Confederates, "You lost. Deal with it. Get over it. We have a past, and it's going to be a past, as, uh, and and that's and it's dead." We have a future, and the future is going to be part of the United States, so we're going to have to live that way. So part of it's principled, but also part of it's pragmatic, too. Uh, part of it, and the pragmatic part is, let's not poke the hornet's nest. Uh, we're trying to get through Reconstruction with as few constraints as possible on the South. Let's not do things that will aggravate Northerners and make them clamp down on us. So there's a mix of the principle and the pragmatic in Lee's response. But basically his response is, don't, don't do statues. And I think the idea of putting up statues to Robert Ely would probably have, have aggravated him more than, than flattered him. Um, on the other hand, Robert E. Lee is not what you would call uh, a perfect icon of Reconstruction either. Mm -hmm. He will, as long as he's president of Washington College, he will prevent students from harassing freed slaves and especially the schools that were set up for freed slaves by the American Missionary Association. Uh, he, if he catches students uh, playing pranks that way, and some of these pranks were almost lethal, uh, if he catches them doing pranks, he'll expel them. But is that because he really is the friend of the freed slaves? Or is it because, again, pragmatically, he's trying to avoid some kind of confrontation with federal authorities? It's not always easy to pull the two apart. So how would Lee respond to these things? Well, it is curious when you read an encomium like that of the New York Herald. How could, in just five years, everyone have decided that Robert E. Lee uh, should not be regarded as a traitor? that Robert E. Lee should be regarded as, as an American hero of some definition, however you define hero. But bear in, mind, bear in mind two things. One is that for many Americans in the North, uh, the Civil War was only an episode of a larger struggle in the 19th century. The United States is an island as a republic, as a democratic republic, in a sea of autocracies. And we were very much threatened or felt threatened at all points by autocracies, for instance, the French autocracy that was set up in Mexico, or even by the British in Canada. 
And the sense that we had to face a hostile world as a democratic republic meant that for after the Civil War, there was a great incentive for people to say, look, we've got to get together. We've got to create a united front again because we are this we are the only large scale successful surviving republic in the Western world. We have to unite. We have to face down the possible uh, attempts of foreign dictators, kings, emperors, and whatnot uh, to undermine the American Republic. So let, let's let's get over the war. Let's uh, exalt Robert E. Lee. Let's promote a spirit of reconciliation because we are living in a threatening world. Now, we don't sense that today. We don't feel like we're living so much in that kind of world. But in the 1870s, Americans did feel that way, that they were this citadel, this outpost, and trying to present this kind of united front to a world full of hostile political regimes was uh, was a very serious effort on their part. So yes, let's let's rehabilitate Robert E. Lee. We may need him at some point. Chris, you want one more? We we can we can go a little long. Okay. Well, yeah. I just I mean, you uh, Robert E. Lee is one of these figures that everybody knows something about, or at least thinks they do. Um, you approach this biography, as you said, you know, there have there been a lot written earlier, but there have been this gap of biographies, and you're coming back to the subject. You obviously bring a huge knowledge of the period to your research, but in doing, spending so much time with Lee, um, did you find things that surprised you about him or things that you didn't expect to find? Um, and, and kind of wrapping up totally, how do we deal with Lee now? How do Americans... What do they do with him? Well, that's that's two very complicated questions. Um, is there anything about Lee that surprised me? Yes. The big thing that surprised me was how difficult it was to, to figure the man out, to understand the man. He was frequently described as the marble model. And when Connolly uses a phrase like that, the marble man, as his biography, uh, the title of his biography of Lee, or at least a study, it's not so much a biography as it is a study of Lee. That's, that, that, yeah, that really lays out a lot of the impression that Lee made on people. That somewhere behind the shield the man always presented to people, there was something that they just couldn't fathom, they just couldn't penetrate to. Uh, Freeman tried to pretend that there was nothing there, that Lee was simply what he appeared to be, simple, straightforward, uncomplicated. And that was never something I, was, I really instinctively bought into. So the, the trouble for me was, how do I get behind the shield? How do I figure the man out? I had a friend who would ask me at times during the process of writing this book, have you figured him out yet? And I would always have to say, no, no, I'm still working on it. I haven't found the key yet. And it wasn't until slowly, laboriously working through this, this enormous mass of Lee correspondence and papers that I started to pick up the threads of the three poles that I talked about. Perfection, independence, security. Putting that together, I started to begin to understand the man. But that was a surprise because you had to get behind that shield in order to do it. You had to piece it together. You had to find the little the little cracks in the teacup that would open up an entire vision into the man's character. So that that was a that was a major challenge and that was a major surprise to find these things in Lee's life. Um, what do we make of Lee going forward? Well, for a long time people talked about Lee as a great model for Americans to follow, which I always found a rather difficult prescription, because how do you follow the path of someone who committed treason? My, my father was a career army officer. He took the oath. My son is a serving officer of the U.S. Army. He took the oath. I even took the oath when I uh, was a, became a member of the uh, National Council on the Humanities uh, under President Bush. And I, that, to me, that was a serious moment. How, how does how does someone go back on that? I just can't look at someone who goes back on that and, and and treat it lightly. So, I have myself the a view of Robert E. Lee 
that is filled with a certain sense of anger, why did he do it? If, I mean, if there's a question that echoes on every page of that book, it's that question, you know, why did you do it? And the answer that emerged from looking at the way he made his decisions is so inadequate. Do you almost say, you shouldn't have done this. You did it wrong. So I want to rebuke him. Yet at the same time, I also understand he made other decisions too, which in an ironic way saved us. And what, I, what I'm thinking of particularly is the surrender at Appomattox. Mm -hmm. Lee could have gone to Appomattox, talked with Grant, and said, nothing doing. And walked out of the McLean house and told his army to scatter to the hills and carry on a guerrilla war. Now, we had a bad enough time as it was during Reconstruction. There were kind of, uh, uh, Reconstruction was a kind of insurrection, kind of insurgency. But nothing that it would have been if Robert E. Lee had gone to his army and said, forget it, boys, head for the hills. We're going to carry on for, and fight these Yankees for another 30 years behind every fence and behind every tree in the Appalachians. The cost that that would have exacted of us as a, as a country is it, it, almost, it's almost beyond reckoning. Surrendering the way he did was probably the best thing he could have done for the country. So there are, there, are, there are parts about him that I have so much difficulty with. There are other parts that I can say that I'm grateful for. I try to be guided in putting all of this together by a favorite literary critic of mine, the great John Gardner, who made a very early impression on me. I was reading Gardner back in the 1970s. And he had a formula which, which, which guided me in dealing with Lee, and I think can guide us in dealing with any difficult biography. Gardner said, no compassion without will. In other words, no cheap empathy, no cheap bygones be bygones, no compassion without will. You have to have the will to judge. You have to have the will as a history person, as a biography, biographer to say, this person was wrong. What they did was wrong. What they thought was wrong. And Lee's attitude towards slavery is wrong, and he knew it was wrong. His, his decision to turn on his country was wrong, and he knew it was wrong. So you have to have the will to make that judgment. And I, I make that judgment, and probably some people are going to be very angry at me for saying that about Robert E. Lee. All right, I'll let the chips be where they may. But at the same time, you have to show, as you have to show that will to judge, you also have to have compassion, because this is the other half of Gardner's formula. No true will without compassion. So at the end of the day, what do I do with Robert E. Lee? I try to do what many people in those days said, and that is, we cannot be a nation that hangs people, that hangs its, its defaulters. This is a nation which has the capacity to forgive. It can forgive even the kind of thing that Robert E. Lee did. I think that glorifies us as a democracy much more than the exacting of the pound of flesh, historically or otherwise. So, yes, I'm going to exercise the will to judge, but at the same time, I want to also exercise the real compassion. And I think that is a way for all of us to move forward. Alan Gelzo, uh, thank you so, thank you much, so much for your, uh, you know, your erudition and your uh, eloquence and your thoughts on uh, Robert E. Lee. And we want to remind, if, if every member of our audience has not already bought the book, I'd be surprised. <laughs> But, but as a rem they should. As a reminder, Robert E. Lee, A Life by Alan Gelzo. And thank you so, so thank much for so joining much us Rick. today on History right. Happy Hour. Rick, Chris, thanks very much for the opportunity. And it's been a fun time. And uh, 
Enjoy London and enjoy Mexico. I will. Okay, well, Thanks I'll so enjoy much. Mexico for one more day and <laughs> Chris right. has some time in London. Take care. Thank Good you so much. Well, Chris, we went a little long, but wow. Yeah, it so, was worth it. so worthwhile. Wow. Um, wow. <laughs> I, I, uh, listen, a uh, couple of things, though, before we, we yes. jump away. Uh, I want to mention um, that there are four spots left, Chris. I think still on our Normandy yep. Masterclass. And this is where uh, uh, five Stephen Ambrose historians are going to be bickering among themselves for a week <laughs> about who knows more about Normandy. And you could be there uh, for right. this in April. Uh, uh, but seriously, I think it's going to be a great trip yeah, uh, that people might want to take a look at. And Normandy, and I'll put that, in, uh, it's not on the website because it's secret. Right, so shh, don't tell anybody. Uh, but I'll put that phone number up there. That's the Ambrose Tours phone number. You can call and get details about it. That's a one-week trip in April that I think is going to be very different and very special. Um, and uh, uh, Chris, uh, what have we got going on next week? I think we have Peter Hart on, don't yeah, we? Yeah, so uh, I'm really, again, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, Peter Hart uh, is the former head um, oral historian for the Imperial War Museum. He's on a wonderful unit history of a British artillery regiment, um, which is fascinating in its own right, but uh, he's also great because he's the co-host of a podcast called Pete and Gary's Military History, which is one of those things that got me through lockdowns. So i uh, really looking forward to talking to Peter about his new book, about oral history, about interviewing all these veterans, uh, and kind of the craft of... Because of wasn't he stories. like 20 years head of oral history at yeah. the Imperial War Museum? So, so when he writes his books, he actually talks to the guy who he's quoting, which yeah. is... Well, 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 our current author today, uh, Alan, who's still listening, I see. Yes. He, he could not talk to anybody who was I there. Was in the right. He did the best he could. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that's next week, and that should be awesome. And thank you, everyone, Thanks for joining everybody. us today. Really appreciate it. All right. Be safe. See you soon. And if I could remember to hit the right thing at the right time. Yeah.